Our sermon passage from this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Here are the words of the Lord Jesus. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our passage this morning is one of the more famous passages inside this larger section of very famous passages. The Sermon on the Mount is full of probably the most common and familiar passages for sermons, maybe even for the things that you kind of hear people quote um, throughout Scripture. The Beatitudes from verses 2 to 11, which we finished last week, are maybe the most familiar to people, where Jesus is, is describing for his people the reality of the nature of the people of the kingdom. Right, so what are the characteristics that describe the people who are citizens of his kingdom? That's what the question is. As those who are citizens, first and foremost of the kingdom of God, what ought Christians' lives to look like? Where we left off was Jesus making it very clear, verses 10 through 12, that the people of God will face persecution. This isn't an unusual occurrence. It isn't um, something that happens for some believers, but something that seemingly happens for all believers, if not martyrdom, it may be as simple as being reviled and having evil uttered against them for Jesus' sake. And if that's true, then I think all of us have experienced some form of persecution or opposition, some sort of, some sort of response from people that is um, against the gospel and thus against us. As Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So it's not an uncommon experience, it's common. It's just part and parcel of following Jesus. If you follow Christ, you will seek righteousness. If you seek a godly life, you'll face opposition in big ways, and small ways. This is what happens when the people of God live for God. Because ultimately, this is the, the kind of the essence of this is there's no such thing as private faith. There's no such thing as living for God in secret. Not in a, not in a very real sense. I mean, the, your life is public. You're going to do this before others. You're not going to just do this in the quietness of your own heart without any public affirmations or actions. That's not Christianity. Christianity is public. It's lived out. It's spoken out loud. Now, you might be able to avoid some opposition if you stay quiet. And there would definitely be some people who would much prefer Christians to keep our views to ourselves and go underground. But we've been called to declare right from wrong, to call people from darkness into Christ's marvelous light. That means we don't have a private religion that we practice behind closed doors. We have a public religion that, that we practice in the light of day, living lives of bold obedience, speaking truth, taking every thought captive, defeating arguments lobbed up against the glory and truth of God, not letting people walk into hell with us keeping our mouths shut for fear of persecution but loving people enough to proclaim the gospel and suffer whatever comes our way in response, as the great preacher said, make them climb to hell over our fallen bodies. On top of that, he says we're blessed. Christ says we're blessed in that opposition and persecution. We are favored by God by being persecuted. This is the impact of public faith. One can't be poor in spirit or meek or mournful or hungering after righteousness or merciful or pure in heart or a peacemaker in isolation. They require us interacting with people. Those are relational qualities lived out among other Christians and in the midst of an unbelieving world. So our passage this morning picks up on that theme. In fact, Jesus digs in deeper on the public nature of the Christian faith. The Christian faith is social, it's public, it's outward facing even. And Jesus uses two images to teach us that truth, salt and light. Through these two common and familiar images, he teaches Christians how our faith is to be lived out in the world. I mentioned last week that Jesus transitioned from third person, right? Blessed are those who are persecuted to the second person. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. This isn't about kind of a statement about believers generically, 
But for these believers, the ones who are hearing this, he's saying to you, I'm telling you, you are salt, you are light. Speaking to them and clearly marking out the expectation for the Christian life. You will be persecuted. And now you are to live your faith publicly as salt and light. You are salt. You are light. And so I want us as, as hearers today, as readers today, to look at this and understand that, that this is Christ talking to his people. And he's making it very clear that all of his people, us, you, me, everyone who follows Christ, these statements are true of. You will be persecuted, he says. You are salt. You are light. You don't get to go, well, those are the salty Christians over there. Those are the light Christians over there. Maybe sometimes I kind of float in and out. No, this is a, a statement of reality for all believers. So when you were reading through this, understand that Christ is speaking to all of his people and saying, this is what is true of you. Look with me at verse 13, and we see Jesus use the metaphor of salt to communicate how believers, these kingdom citizens, will impact the world around them. I know some of you are already thinking, I know your tricks, salt and light in one week. Come on now. <laughs> Certainly we're going to spread that out into two weeks. Nope, we're going to do it all together, and hopefully you'll see why as we kind of do it all together. Look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I'm sure you've heard this verse before. Or maybe you've heard someone refer to someone as being salt of the earth when they mean they're a good person. They're honest and reliable. They're beneficial to others. Perhaps you've heard sermons on this verse before, and each one inevitably starts with describing what salt does or what these original hearers would understand salt to be. Well, that makes sense. It doesn't do much good for us to read Jesus' statement and read only our modern usage of salt back into it. We primarily, we primarily use salt to season things. That's how we use salt, right? Some of us could stand to use a little more salt in our food, right? Some of you, your doctors have told you, don't use any more salt. I, I don't need that kind of negativity in my life, so I don't listen to those kind of doctors. I like salt, right? Because salt makes things taste better. We primarily use salt to season food. I mean, if you use salt right, you don't need much more than that to grill a good ribeye, right? You salt that thing well, it's going to taste fantastic. But the primary usage to Jesus' hearers wasn't as a condiment. And that's kind of how we use salt, right, as a condiment. It's something we keep on the table. And we use it in that way. So what was salt used for? Well, primarily it was used as a preservative to keep meat from decaying since there were no refrigerators, there's no freezers. You have a piece of meat. You cover it in salt. It causes all the water and moisture to be drawn out of the meat. By the way, which is why you should salt your steaks before you grill them now, because it causes all the moisture to come out. helps to grill a better steak. Just, that's, that's free. <laughs> and not in my notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it effectively draws out, dries out the steak. It draws out, dries out the meat. Why? To keep bacteria from growing in it, because it's in that moisture that the bacteria grows. And so usually they would either salt it in two ways. One, with a dry salt kind of thing that would preserve the meat, kind of dries it out, uh, which would create something akin to like beef jerky, right? Kind of draw out all the, the moisture and kind of dry everything out. Or they would use a brining solution, which is again, is salt. Same kind of function, um, but that's a little, a, a little shorter term. That's how food was kept safe. Those methods were used universally, up through the 20th century, and even today in some places of the world. And some of you are going, this is what we do now. Like, I still do that. That's, that's true. In some places, we still do that. Now it's, an, now it's an option for us as opposed to a necessity. But before, it was a necessity. This, if you had meat and you wanted to preserve it and keep from getting sick, this is how you had to do it. You used salt. Salt was a preservative. So when Jesus is saying, uh, to, speaking of salt, the people aren't hearing taste. They're not hearing flavor. Right? They're not, that's not what they're hearing. They're hearing preservation. When Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, he's telling his disciples, you have a unique role in this world, in this culture, in society. You have the role of preservation. Why is that important? Because the world is devolving and decomposing like a piece of meat. Mankind is sinful, and everything man touches starts to rot and tear away Jesus says that Christians, that kingdom citizens, are to live in the world in such a way that we realize that our role, to a large part, is to be a preserving agent in the world. We, if no one else does, are actively conserving moral norms and realities that God has laid forth as truth in Scripture. We are slowing in some way the decay and rot of the world. 
It's odd to think about that as much as the, as the world is decaying, the violence and disregard for human life expanding, the hatred of the good, the true, and the beautiful, the rejection of the creator of this universe and his moral law. It's hard to think about that. But things are going downhill fast to hell in a handbasket, as they might say. We see this. World history has demonstrated it repeatedly. The world began as sinless creation, yet man chose to sin and rebel against a holy God. And since, since sin entered the world, so did death and decay. God even dealt with this through flood. And man still rebelled. On the other side of the flood, when there's only eight persons left, man still rebels by choice and by sinful nature. The decline is steep. The slope is slippery. The decay is certain. And yet in the midst of this rapidly decaying sinful world, God has placed a preservation agent, his church, his people. Something to slow the decline, to uphold moral law and virtue, to point to the creator, to proclaim the truth of the gospel and salvation. The role of Christ's people, the church, in our society is to proclaim the gospel, to be a, but also to be a preserving agent in the world. So we have this kind of dual task as we're citizens in this world, but also citizens of the kingdom. Our primary task is to proclaim the gospel, but even that is a preserving agent, isn't it? Because in proclaiming the gospel, we're proclaiming the truth about who God is, his holiness, his law, the sinfulness of man, the rebellion of man against God, the, the means of salvation, which is Christ's sinless life, his death on the cross in our place, and his resurrection from the dead. We're proclaiming these truths and calling all men to repent of sins and believe. So as we proclaim the gospel, that in and of itself is a preserving agent for our society, for our culture. But even above that, as we proclaim truth, we are standing fast on the word of God, the moral law of God, and we're proclaiming what is, what ought to be. And as those things are proclaimed in our society, that's preser preserving it in some way. I want to make a side note here. Some, some people ask why many Christians tend to identify as conservatives, and I think there's a, a carryover here. When it comes to politics, I think you could point to this passage, the church is preservative, because by nature, to conserve something means to hold on to it. You see some value in it, and you uphold it, and you hold on to it, while everything around it is trying to tear it down. And so there is a sense in which conservation, being conservative in that way, is true. Now, one could squabble over what policies um, make up being conservative. One may not be, identify that even with a particular uh, political party, this is an idea. The general idea of conservatism is about upholding and preserving what is good in society, moral norms, the basic structures that build society, such as families and religion. These are the basic structures that uphold our society. And so we have to understand that not all movement is progress, right? And not all supposed progress is moving in the right direction. In fact, much of progressivism is about moving away from moral norms and a rejection of God his church, of the family, of the structures that God has ordained for our good and for our actual flourishing. I mean, we talked about this in our equipping class this morning about the, just even having to stop to take time to, just, to define what a man is, what a woman is, what marriage is. These are, by nature, conservative statements, right? And you go, you got to get out of your mind just political parties here. We're conserving what God's word says about these things. In a culture that goes, you can't know what a man is, you can't know what a woman is, you can't know what sex is, you can't know what gender is, you can't know what, what marriage is, you can't know any of these things, they're all on a spectrum, they're all, they're all changing, I wake up today, I feel like this, I wake up tomorrow, I feel like that. We change everything, all around. The, the culture is kind of constantly inundating us, kind of constantly pushing to tear down these, these norms, and as Christians, forget about being political here, we're being, just as a religious Christian, as a, as a follower of Christ, we uphold the word of God, and it is by nature conserving something. It is by nature protecting the reality of what things are, how God defines things from a culture that's trying to tear it down by the winds of, of redefining everything. And so we are by nature conserving something. Now, in fact, most of... Uh, of what we see in the world around us is trying to tear down norms as if progressivism is a ideal when really it's a rot and decay that we see throughout culture. 
Think about what's celebrated and promoted within progressivism. It's at odds with Christian beliefs about humanity, about morality, about marriage, even about reality and truth. It isn't just a disagreement about policies. It's an entire worldview difference. And as Christians, that would inform our politics. To be a social conservative and oppose the redefinition of family and marriage, the undermining of what manhood and womanhood is, the value of human life, the preservation and protection of God-given rights. These are good positions for us to have and seem to fit hand in glove with what Jesus says we're here to be about, to preserve truth and reality. In this sense, conservatism is how we relate to society conservatism and how we relate to society overlaps with what the church is called to do as a preserving agent. Does that make sense? That's, the, that's, a, that's a difficult thing for us to think about because we think, okay, let's just keep to our sphere. Our sphere is only to proclaim the gospel inside the, the walls of our church. But that's not exactly true, is it? I mean, that's our primary responsibility. Our primary responsibility, the, the, the thing that Christians are primarily about is what happens right here on Sunday morning. It's primarily, but it's not the only thing we're about. So the only thing, the only responsibility we have, we have a responsibility to proclaim the word of God outside these walls as well. And guess what that looks like? It looks confrontational. It looks mean-spirited at times. But it looks like being salt and light to a world around us that is constantly decaying. And God has given us that as that preserving agent to the world. If we were to re- retreat back in ourselves and say nothing out there, what does that say? We don't care. God's word doesn't matter. God's law doesn't matter. God's, God's, God's created order doesn't matter. And that's not what we want to say. Now, so I'm saying all those things, and maybe you're hearing me one way, and I want to be clear of this. We're not, this is not about me, about trusting a particular po- pro, uh, political party. You understand that? Like, for us to do this as a church, we're to be clear about the truth. Not giving up ground to redefine reality. And listen, I don't think there's a, a single political party that lines up with us on all these things. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that we have to proclaim the truth. And at times it's going to align us with certain groups of people. And at times it's going to put us at odds with certain people. This is about not giving up ground to redefine reality, to redefine marriage or manhood or womanhood. The church is the salt of the earth, right? And so... To be clear about that, the church is the salt of the earth. The GOP is not the salt of the earth, right? To make that kind of plain. So the church needs to stand for truth. The church is the preserving agent. So regardless of what political party is doing, listen, listen they're going to go off the wall too because we are the ones that are given the truth of the word of God as the church. So we need to be wise when it comes to politics. We can't neglect the fact that it's our task to declare truth. Sometimes that aligns us with political parties. Other times we stand alone when we stand for truth. Our hope is in Christ, and not everyone agrees with that. Ultimately, we want to point them to Christ, not just win an election. So that's our role. Remember, our prime objective is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so our preserving task informs our salvation gospel task. To be salt means to be a preservative, to preserve and conserve what is good and true, to point people to the one who defines goodness and truth, to uphold his standards in a world seeking to destroy all standards while calling it progress. The church is to help preserve, like salt preserves meat against decay. The world is in decay and getting worse. You guys understand that, right? It will not and cannot reverse course and fix itself. The preserving agent, the only preserving agent in the world is the church. So far from being a call to retreat from society, this seems to be a call to be bold and live the Christian life and pursue biblical values and beliefs in the world publicly and without shame. The idea that we'd be silent and just practice our private religion behind closed doors seems antithetical to what Christ has said is one of our main reasons for existence. If you think about it, this puts Jesus' previous comments about our expected persecution in perspective, doesn't it? You only get persecuted when you say things that are contrary to what the world is believing and doing. If we just go out there and go, hey, listen, we're not mad at anybody. We don't want to uphold anything. We just want to be left alone. and leave. We're not going to upset anybody with that. We won't face any persecution that, that way. If you just affirm what everyone wants you to affirm, if you just treat your life like you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, where you're like, oh, it's, it's June. Let's put the rainbow flag on our, on our logo. It's time. 
oh, it's July, let's do this for this month or whatever. You just want us to affirm everything. You're never going to face persecution. The idea that Jesus is telling us, you will face persecution. You will, as you seek to live a godly life, face opposition is telling you that, you're, that your faith is to be lived out loud in public. And it's going to put you at odds with people. It's going to put you at odds with the culture. Kind of puts everything in perspective a little bit for me, I think. Those committed to their own sin hate it when people hold them accountable or call out their sin. Have you ever noticed that? When you have a friend or a loved one who is deep in their own sin and you happen to say, listen, I just want you to know this is wrong. Your thinking is warped here. You're, what you're doing is, is immoral. It's wrong. Does that go over well? Typically, that gets you hung up on or deleted as a friend, unfollowed on social media. Those who want to pursue their own desires will hate it when people call them to die to self and kill their desires. And they'll hate it even more when those same people's lives back up what they're saying. When they're preaching and preserving the truth. That's why people, the people of God should expect persecution. If they reject Christ, they'll reject his people. If they love sin, they'll hate those who call it sin. But what happens when the people of God, here's, so the, I think that's something we can all get behind. But the question that Jesus kind of then goes to is, what happens when the people of God live lives that are inconsistent with what they're preaching and promoting? All right, so if, if you're being consistent, if you're going to proclaim the truth boldly, if you're going to live a life that is consistent with what you're preaching, you're going to face opposition. What happens when you, preach, when you live a life that's inconsistent? Look back at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, as we read it in the ESV, you'll note that, that the concern is when salt has lost its taste. And you might say, wait, I thought it wasn't about flavor. This was about preservation. But the issue isn't really taste, which is why some translators instead translated this as if the salt loses its saltiness. In keeping with the second half of the verse, right? The issue is about the salt losing its very nature as salt. Saltiness is about the essence of being salt, not flavor. It's not about flavor degrading. It's, not about, not, it's, a, it's about it not being salt any longer. That's the metaphor. Salt that's no longer doing its job as salt. In reality, it's a hard metaphor because salt is a very stable compound. It doesn't actually go bad. It doesn't actually lose taste. Have you ever poured out salt out of the salt shaker and been like, this salt's gone bad. Like, there's no expiration date. Salt doesn't lose its flavor. It doesn't lose its taste. So, like, it can't mean that. It's talking about when salt no longer serves the role it's supposed to serve. When salt stops being salt. So again, it's not about flavor. It's about the task given to the salt. It can, if it can no longer be used for its purpose, all you can do is throw it on the street because it's worthless. It's just fancy looking rocks at that point. Now it's fair to ask if salt can't actually stop being salt. If it doesn't lose flavor, if salt is, will always stay salt, then what way can salt lose its saltiness? So there's only one way that salt can stop being salt and it's if Something else gets added to it such that it gets so adulterated that it no longer works as salt. Salt doesn't break down that way. It doesn't stop being able to be used for preservative until, unless, enough of it gets mixed, enough of something else gets mixed in with it that it no longer is able to serve as preservative. Salt only ceases that when it's been contaminated. It's now effectively no longer salt. The contamination has made it unable to do what it does. So again, this isn't about high quality salt versus low quality salt. This isn't about Himalayan salt versus whatever table salt. What was once salt, but that has lost any ability to do what salt was created to do so that it cannot be called salt anymore. This new substance, this new compound isn't even salt. It doesn't preserve, it's useless. So you throw it out where you throw all the rubbish, the street, and you let it be trampled underfoot. So in keeping with that metaphor, how might the church lose its saltiness? What is it that Jesus is warning the church about? And the obvious answer is when it stops being what God created it to be, when it stops believing the truth and living the truth and proclaiming the truth, when it gets so adulterated 
by the things around it that it no longer is communicating what God has called it to communicate. When it stops pursuing righteousness, when it no longer hungers and thirsts for righteousness, when it isn't poor in spirit or meek and mournful over sin, when it isn't merciful or pure in heart and peacemakers, when it has given up all the qualities that define who the church is, then it's no longer salt. How does that happen? It happens through contamination, through adulteration, through corruption, through the rejection of God's word, through imbibing the patterns, attitudes, and beliefs of the world when it stops fighting the deterioration of the world and starts going along with it like everyone else does. You want to see what the ch- when the, the church, when it's no longer salt? The church, when it's no longer salt, is the church that doesn't preach the word of God, that doesn't call out sin, that doesn't dis- discipline members in the church who are in sin. That's a, that's a church that's no longer salt. When the church is flying the flag of the world and not flying the flag of the gospel. You want to know churches that are adulterated? Look at what they're proclaiming. Look at how they're living. Are they pushing people to righteousness and holiness? Calling people to repent of sin and believe? Calling people away from the darkness of the world and into the light of Christ? Are they doing that or are they just telling you what you want to hear? The world is in need of the church to be the church. They don't need us to be yet another voice that just echoes what they're already seeing on television, what they're already hearing on the radio, what they're already taking in in books and lectures, what they're being taught in their college classes. They don't need the church to just be another voice doing the same thing. What the world needs is for us to do what God has called us to do, which is be salt and light, proclaim the truth of the gospel, and live in light of the gospel. We don't help the world or anyone in it when we become just like it. It's our distinctiveness that defines us. And you know what? That means we're weird. It means that we are out of step with with culture. It means we're not cool enough. We're not smart enough. We're not aware of all the things that are happening in the culture. We're not not up to date with all the latest trends. It's okay to not be cool. Um, You know, I didn't know that 20 years ago. Now that I'm in my, I have to say mid-40s now. Do I have to say that? Now that I'm in my mid-40s, I understand, I understand the, the pull of cool in a much more detached way now. I'm, I'm less in, enthralled by that. I recognize I'm not cool anymore. Was I once cool? Maybe. I don't know. Probably not. Probably not as cool as I thought, right? But th- that kind of acceptance by the world, there, there comes a point where, where you, you stop being like, caring to, to be accepted by the world and being cool by the world. That's when, like, they make fun of, like, people my age who wear, like, white New Balances, right? Sorry if there's anyone who wear white. Right? Like, like, oh, like, oh, you, look, you dress like a dad now. It's because you no longer care about being cool. And you go, well, what, what does that mean? Well, your priorities change, right? The dad who's wearing the white New Balances, sorry, guys, wearing the white, the dad wearing, the, he doesn't care about that. What, he has a bigger task than trying to be cool. What is it? Raising those kids, Seeing them come to faith in Christ, proclaiming the truth of the gospel, discipling other people, showing hospitality in his house to those from the church and the community. There's so many other things that we have responsibility for that, guess what? I'm, buying, I'm not wearing this season's clothes. I'm not up on the latest TV show or the latest pop culture thing. I'm, I may not be up on those things because it doesn't matter because my priorities are different now. And that's what it's like for the church. The ch- for the church to be salt, it's distinct. It's separated. And we do that sometimes better than others. This is what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. We don't look like the world to try to win it. That's foolishness. Yet that is what some Christians are suggesting. Don't preach biblical sexuality. Don't call homosexuality a sin. Don't call, talk about the hard parts of Christianity. Don't believe in miracles. Don't talk about the virgin birth or resurrection. Don't talk about a Bible without error. If you want to reach the world today, don't you know that's what you have to do to reach the world today. But listen, that's the same heresy that's been communicated to the, that people have been trying to convince the church of for hundreds of years. That's not new. That's not a 2022 thing. That was a 1962 thing. That was an 1862 thing. There's, it's always been the thing to try to get us to stop preaching the gospel, to stop preaching the word of God. But those are all calls to not be salt. 
If we reject those doctrines, we're no longer preaching the truth. We're no longer salt. We're no longer preserving truth in society. But our lack of saltiness could also be if we fail to live lives of holiness. Does that mark some of us today? Maybe, maybe we hold fast to the truth, but we don't live in light of the truth. We publicly communicate the truth of the gospel. We privately take part of sin. That too is a rejection of the truth. The pursuit of sin, the rejection of the life Christ has called us to is a rejection of him. That's adulteration as well. That's contamination as well. So salt can lose saltiness in both ways. If we reject truth, if we reject holiness, that's how we cease to be salt. Our beliefs and our deeds reject the truth. And that's the irony, though, by the way, of progressivism. In the attempt to be more appealing to the world, we actually become so useless that we get trampled underfoot. Have you ever noticed that the denominations that 60 years ago were suggesting that we got to stop preaching the truth of the word? I know you guys believe in an errant word, but that's that's passe. Um, Literally heard a professor at Hardin-Simmons about 10 years ago say, only rednecks believe in the inerrancy of scripture. Backwoods rednecks. You know, Jason Wright and I look at ourselves and I guess we're backwoods rednecks. I mean, who knew? I just, I've been called a lot of things. That's not one of them, but, um, but that's the, that's the we, we've moved beyond that. No one still believes that nonsense. No one still believes the norms about human sexuality. No one still believes the miracles took place. What are you talking about? Resurrection from the dead that doesn't happen. And so all, if you want to reach a world around us that no longer believes those things, you got to stop believing those things as well. And you know what happened to every single one of those denominations that taught those things? They're dying all around us. All around us. The latest, the United Methodist Church. I knew it was bad when a friend of mine who was in the United Methodist Church and is now leaving sent me a uh, clip of uh, a church not far from them who has, whose pastor is um, a cross-dressing uh, pastor. Like he, a drag queen pastor, drag queen pastor of a Methodist church. You shouldn't conserve norms. We should conserve norms. We should hold fast to truth because that's what you end up with. And listen, you can't be winsome enough or change enough beliefs to be attractive to a world in decay. All we can be is faithful salt. And it's okay. Be faithful salt. It's our task. It's who we are. We're salt. So be salt. The world doesn't need more dirt. And when we stop being salt, that's all we are. More dirt. Thrown out in the street. In the, street. the world doesn't need more dirt. It needs more salt. So be salt. First metaphor for how believers relate to the world around us. How we live as Christians in the world. But it's not the only one. Second one, it actually helps us see our role a bit more clearly. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So as Christ people, we are not just salt, not just a preservative, but we are light. Well, How? Like a city on a hill that can't be hidden. A place not in private isolation, but on public display. Such that people from miles around can see the city up on the hill. And the light from that city shines out indiscriminately on all who come near the city. That city on a hill is one of two sources of physical light found in these verses. The other is a lamp. Look at verse 15. In order people light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In both cases, the expectation is for the light source to be public, obvious, and visible. It may be hard for many modern people to think about how a city can be a source of light, but there's many of you in in here that live outside the city and you know what it means, right? You turn off the lights to your house, it's dark, and you can look back and you're like, there's where Abilene is. You see the lights. We're not even up on a hill. We're in a basin. That's why your allergies are jacked up, right? Right? We're not even up on a hill, but the light emits from the city so much that even wherever you're at, you can go, okay, the city's over there. I see the light coming out from, from there. Now, imagine it's before electricity. Imagine it's before city lights and street lights and headlights on vehicles. And you're just in the wilderness and it's dark. How much light would a city up on a hill give off in that situation. That's the way that the church is supposed to be light in the world. 
you are in the darkest part of the world. No light around whatsoever. And yet here is one light, one city up on a hill, shining out for all people. So the people who are lost know, okay, that's where the city is. I, I can go and find help there. Those, those who, are, who, who need supplies or lacking water or food can go there and find help. A little bit of light pierces through the darkness. A little bit of light exposes so much. Jesus' illustration of the city being seen is, cl- is quite clearly not due to its elevation. It's about the source of its light. He's not saying, oh, the, the, the big point about it being, about the, being light of the world is that you're up high. No, the point is it's light. It shines to reveal the area, provide a guidepost. Jesus is telling his disciples, you are the light of the world. Just like that city on the hill, you are the source of light that illuminates an entire area, shining light through the darkness, revealing the terrain, lighting the path for travel, exposing the dangers that would otherwise be hidden in the dark. I mean, think about that world. No street lights, no electricity, the darkness of the world. When the sun goes down, the world shuts down. Right? When the sun comes back up, the world opens back up because light is necessary for things to be happening. Things can't be seen in the dark, and thus it makes even more sense for people to associate darkness with evil, with danger. The light from the city then becomes this incredible help to those lost in darkness, those wandering in darkness, lost in danger. But even on a smaller scale, life, light is life-giving and life-saving. When the sun goes down, how does one do anything? You need a lamp. Look at verse 15 again. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Well, why would that be necessary? Because you, can't, you fumble around inside the house if there's no light. Have you ever, have you ever woken up in the middle of the night when the, lights, when, the, when the power has gone out? And you struggle to find your way around, bumping into things. You're like, you live in that house. You know where things are. Why do you struggle? Because just even not seeing where things are, we, we don't, we can't function. We can't operate as we normally do. We need a light. And it would be foolish to light a lamp and then put it under a basket. You're neg- negating the beneficial properties of the lamp. That's dumb. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. That's what everyone's thinking, right? You put the lamp up on a stand. And then it gives light to the whole house. You can see what you're doing. You can move around freely. What would have been impossible in the dark is now possible in the light. Even the most modest amount of light from a lamp, which pales in comparison to the sun shining, is able to give light, and such light gives light to all in the house. By the way, this light-darkness metaphor is seen throughout Scripture. The Gospel of John visits it repeatedly, primarily to speak of Jesus. In John 1, we read this, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's big, right? Because there comes a point where your light runs out. And what he's saying is the light that's coming in the world, there's no darkness that can overcome that. There's no extent, like, you know, like if I light a candle in a dark room, the light goes only so far. If I have a flashlight, it only shines so far. This light of the world, there's no limitation to its light. There's no, there's no point where the light runs out and dims out and darkness starts up again. That's the, the beauty of this picture, right? The darkness has not overcome it. There's, this light shines to the entire world. And you're like, oh, well, that's good then. Then all people will come to the light, no, right? Unfortunately, no. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Jesus is the light coming into the world, the light that shines in the darkness, the light against which no darkness can hold up. The light had come into the world, but the world didn't know him. Well, why not? That's John 3. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. 
Mankind in our sin loves the darkness. Sin can hide in the darkness. Light exposes the darkness. It reveals what is there, what can be hidden if we keep lights down low. The reality is, though, darkness can only provide temporary cover. Light, deeds get exposed. Be, true, be sure the truth will find you out. Why? Because sooner or later the lights come on. You know, we, I, I never understood when my parents would say to me, um, nothing good happens after 12 o'clock. And my f- response back growing up was, everything good happens after 12 o'clock. <laughs> like, but that's sinful me in my own thinking going, uh, you go, why is that true? Well, they're, they're, they're echoing, they were echoing a, a very parental version of, uh, of the idea that de- like evil deeds are done in darkness. Why? Because there, there's a certain, have you ever noticed that there's certain things that happen at night that don't happen during the day? Very, like people are shocked when they're like, there's a burglary in the middle of the day, right? Because you go, you don't, you don't bur- people don't burglarize home in the middle of the day because that's, that's weird. Although that makes the most sense because no one's home. But you do it at darkness. Why? Because maybe I can get away in the cover of darkness. Maybe I can get away with it. Maybe people won't see my face. Maybe that's why the sins that most of us participate in, we do at night. There's kind of this metaphorical picture of hiding ourselves. Maybe people won't see me. Maybe I can be disguised. Maybe I can kind of blend in with the darkness. Light exposes sin. Our deeds are brought clear when the lights come on. That's why when your power goes out in your house and you're stumbling around in the dark and you finally find those candles or you finally find that flashlight, the one that still has batteries at work, you're able to shine around and you're like, okay, we're okay. Why? Because that light is exposing what's there. You hear that bump in the dark. You hear that sound outside and you want to go turn the lights on to see what's out there. The light exposes what's there. Why do I belabor this metaphor? Because Jesus is saying that's what our job is in the world. We are the floodlight of the world. We're the motion sensor light of the world, right? Things are happening around us and we go, oh, here's what God's word says about this. You have friends around you who are participating in various things and we go, oh, you know, this is what God's word says about this. We, we shine the light on the deeds that people do that are dark. We do, we do that in a loving way, I hope. But we do that in a firm, clear way. We are light. And you go, but God will show that to them. God will reveal that to them. God has chosen to reveal that to them through us. You are the light he's choosing to use to expose the deeds of darkness that he's calling people to repent and leave and come into the, the light of the gospel. Like, don't be so hands-off. Because honestly, when we're hands-off like that, I see this in my own self. When we're hands-off like that, what it really is is cowardice. If I say this, they're not going to like me anymore. If I say this, I'm not going to have a friend. If I say this, it's going to cause a big problem, right? I don't like drama either, and I know if I say this, it's going to be a whole thing, right? And so we talk ourselves out of it because we're cowards, but God has called us to be bold and courageous and to be light and to be salt. And you don't, you don't do that by just sitting in your corner and not talking to anyone. Well, I'll just believe the truth. I won't ever say it. The light has to come on to shine out the truth of the gospel. You have to speak the truth of the gospel. You have to speak the truth of, of sinfulness, the need for repentance and faith. You have to speak those things and call people to believe. And the light exposes darkness, and then opposition to the light happens. The ones who come preaching the message of light, the ones proclaiming the light of the world, they're going to be opposed. John 8, I am the light of the world, Jesus says. Whoever follows me will not, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world, and those who follow him will have the light, but they too will be little lights in this world. That's what our job is. So Jesus calls his people the light of the world and commands them to shine forth as light in a dark world. Don't put a basket over the lamp. Don't turn off the lights of the city. Shine forth bright as a city on a hill, as a lamp on a stand. And what do you do? Look at verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others 
so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. And listen, the others there are not other Christians. Not necessarily. I mean, it's going to happen. But the idea is that you're going to, you are going to live in light of the gospel. You're going to speak the truth of the gospel and other people are going to come into the light. The light of the world, all caps, Jesus, so works in his people that we shine like lights displaying the gospel through our lives. And through those good works, the sun will see them and respond with hostility and anger because their evil deeds are being exposed. That's verse 11 and 12. Though that is true, evidently there will be some in whom the Spirit so works that they will see the good deeds and will turn and give glory to the Father who's in heaven. Isn't that our goal after all? You go, why do we exist? You say salt. You're saying it's to be salt and light, but isn't it to glorify God? Wasn't well, that what he's saying right here? The end result of being salt and light is that other people come and glorify God. Part of how we glorify God is proclaiming the gospel, letting our light shine before men. I mean, this, this is a command for us. Let your light shine before others. By the way, you know, this is the first command in the Sermon on the Mount. A real thing in the Beatitudes was a description. This is a command. Let your light shine. He doesn't call us to be salt and light. He says we are salt and light. He doesn't call us meek and uh, it doesn't call, uh, tell us we need to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness or be meek or being pure in heart. He says those are the descriptions of the church. This is the first command. Let your light shine before men. We've been placed here for that reason. It's the principal function of believers to provide light, to be salt. So let your light shine. As we wrap this up, what would it look like for us to see ourselves as, the, as those saved by the, the light of the world, such that we are now light in the world? It means the gospel we proclaim is shining light. The good works we do, shining light. The righteousness we're pursuing is shining light. Why does it seem that Christians tend to forget this responsibility? Why do we tend to go into our own little enclaves, putting our light under a basket and hiding it? Or worse than that, we snuff out the light so that we don't draw attention to ourselves, so we can fit in, so we don't think we're backwards or out of touch or on the wrong side of history. But the expectation for Christ's people is that they, as those who have seen the light, who have been transferred out of darkness and into his marvelous light, as those who have been saved by the light of the world sent from heaven, there would be light here. And that means pursuing holiness and righteousness. It means proclaiming truth even when it's unpopular. It means confronting error and sin even when it's costly. Not because we're inherently better than anyone else, but because we've been placed here as a city on a hill, as a lamp on a lampstand. And we've been placed here to shine forth the truth of the gospel and the glory of our creator, to point to the moral law of God and the sinfulness of man, like a light switch being flipped on, exposing all the sinful deeds of man. So despite people wanting Christians to shut up sit down in this world, God has called us to a different mission. We're called to speak out and live out the truth, and the sphere of our influence isn't just the privacy of our homes or in the houses of worship, though those are the starting points for, of Christian proclamation. No, our influence is intended to go to the entire earth. The light we shine is intended to shine on all men in all places. The whole earth is the sphere of our gospel influence. And we're to stand like those cities on a hill, shining forth the beacon of the gospel of God's holiness and righteousness, like a lighthouse even guiding ships into the safety of the harbor. In the end, you may face persecution for your godly life, like Hugh Latimer, bishop in England during the Reformation, as he proclaimed biblical truth, he was put to death, being burned at the stake. His final words to fellow martyr Nicholas Ridley were this, be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. What if your persecution and martyrdom is the means of you shining forth the light of, of the gospel? So he saw the faithfulness of preaching the truth, of living a godly life worth whatever it cost, and proclaim the glory of God to a world, perhaps even leading others to respond in kind, even if it meant his death. And that sounds a lot like these verses. I'm not going to lie to you. Being salt is costly. Being light is costly. It isn't going to find favor on cable news or in the pages of the New York Times or even in the Abilene Reporter News. It'll cost you friends. It'll cost you family. It may even cost you job or standing in this world. It may cost your life. But you've been given new life in Christ with the expectation that we as his people will shine before others, calling all men to repent of their sin and to come find life in the only hope they have, the true light of the world, Jesus Christ. And we do this as his little lights to the glory of God the Father. Rejoice that you've been given this responsibility. Let your light shine before men. Don't be afraid. 
Let it shine. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen us. Help us to be bold in proclamation and truth. Lord, help. Don't look, we don't want to be jerks. We don't want to be, um, we don't want to be offensive um, just for the sake of being offensive. But Lord, the gospel is offensive. We recognize that. The truth is offensive. And so Lord, give us boldness. Give us confidence. Give us courage to speak the truth call people to faith and repentance, to call people to leave sin, to call people to repent and believe. We do this for your namesake, for your glory. It's in the name of the light of the world, Jesus Christ, we pray these things.